It's a pleasure to be part of this conference. And um, today I'm going to talk about my desert music course in which I seek to advance environmental stewardship through environmental listening. In the face of ever more dramatic manifestations of climate change, listening to the voices of the land is a powerful tool to overcome multitasking, ocular centrism, and passive listening to learn about and care for its ecosystems. Thus, in several of my courses, I teach listening theories and practices that deepen students' understanding of place, in this case, the US's southwestern deserts. In this paper, I will detail some of the content, assignments, and outcomes of my desert music course, which is multidisciplinary and for international students in music and the arts. Arizona State University is located in the Sonoran Desert, the most biodiverse, but also one of the hottest regions in the US. Featuring unique endemic plant and animal species, this desert has become fragile due to human-induced environmental change. Its lists of endangered plant and animal species are growing because of a warming climate, drought, and habitat fragmentation. Much of this is related to population growth. This desert serves 9 million people with half residing in the Phoenix area. Phoenix's population grows yearly by circa 14%, attracting people from across the globe due to its climate and affordability. ASU is its largest teaching institution with nearly 140,000 students, plus thousands of instructors and staff. New desert residents drive housing and road construction and often don't understand what it means to live with the desert. Often reflecting a settler colonialist's mindset geared toward extraction, they pursue unsustainable lifestyles marked by playing golf and swimming, which along with irrigated agriculture depletes most of the region's water. I developed desert music in 2019 as an interdisciplinary graduate course, blending knowledge from biology, the environmental sciences and humanities and audiology and taught it three times. I first introduced general environmental features and challenges of the desert, whereupon students examine music about Southwestern deserts by composers who, much like tourists, spend little or no time in this region. By composers such as Grofey, Copeland, or Messiaen, who never deeply listen to this desert sounds and often exoticize its landscapes, catering to a tourist gaze. Students also study musicians who have lived in the desert for a long time, including indigenous artists such as Raven Shakun or Ophelia Rivas, whose music responds to their surroundings. Let's just listen to a little bit of Raven Shakun's field recordings. The piece, Field Recordings, was the very first work I had ever done uh, one of the very first compositions I had done, one of the very first recordings I had ever done, and it turned out to be one of the first installations I had ever done. But uh, what it is is myself going to three places around my home uh, from where I grew up, which is the Navajo Nation and, and parts of New Mexico, and uh, places where I felt they were the quietest places I had ever known. And what I wanted to do is just make a field recording of these places and see what I could capture. And so I would go to these places on the quietest day, uh, with no wind, you know, the quietest time of day, which was a lot of times overnight or very early in the morning. And I would just record the place. And when I went back and listened to these recordings, I kept wanting to turn them up as kind of a magnifying glass to, to, to uh, see what I was hearing, if you will. And I kept turning them up, turning them up, and before I knew it, they were turned all the way up. And to me, they presented different colors of these places, different, you know, distinct colors of what these places seem like. 
Students then discuss sonic representation about place and learn about the desert's ecosystems and sounds and basic listening practices. Next, stationary listening modes are explained and practiced in groups. Students often find it hard to listen to non-musical sounds and describe them. Stationary listening is ideal for focusing on environmental sound without distraction from body movement. Students identify sound sources using Krause's categories of geophony, biophony, and anthropony to assess relationships between human and non-human sounds at different times of the day, different days, seasons, and within the Anthropocene. They also learn about the challenges of sound identification and the listener and the listener's perception, psychoacoustics, hearing abilities. In exercises with and without blindfolds, they locate sounds, perceive their features, changes, and successive and simultaneous occurrences, and take notes verbally and graphically. This activity grounds the study of deep listening, pioneered by Oliver Ross. It offers communal and individual creative practices to broaden sensory awareness through a distinction between global and focal attention. Scores from sonic meditation, such as early and environmental dialogue, facilitate global and focal attention to sound and students listening to and merging their sounds with their surroundings without drowning them out. Next, students explore mobile listening modes or sound walks. While popular with many different age groups, sound walks can be more difficult than other modes. The management of body movement, changing ground surfaces and traffic may prevent listeners from focusing on sound, and these challenges are discussed prior to a sound walk. The participant's sonic footprint and anthropony is often addressed after a sound walk. In this unit, students realize scores for sound walks by Schenker and others, and they also design, realize, and analyze their own mobile listening exercises. Field trip. At this stage, uh, students take a field trip with a field recording workshop in which they discover how different microphones impact the quality and quantity of sonic detail in a recording. They also learn about the importance of spending extended periods of time in the field to determine a mic's optimal placement. Crucially, they grasp the immense difference between a field recorder's mechanical capture of sounds and their own embodied listening experience and memory. While recording, they have to listen with and without earphones and compare the recording with their own perceptions. Students now engage in weekly solitary listening exercises, choosing different niches, applying different listening modes and keeping a listening diary. Based on Krause's sonic niche hypothesis, they experience their niches as sonic ecosystems. The niches proceed from urban environments to bodies of water, parks, soil, plants, and animals. The first sonic niche is urban and students study the effects and sounds of urban sprawl, heat islands, smog and social injustices shown in wealthy and quiet versus poor and noisy neighborhoods burdened by excessive ground and air traffic. Schaefer's and Newhouse's concepts of noise pollution, masking and noise propaganda are explored and compared with Robinson's hungry listening critiquing settler colonial sonic perceptions. Students then listen to urban soundscapes, write listening diaries, and realize scores by Cage, Teitelbaum, Robinson, and Robinson responding to sounds of human settlement and explore decolonial listening. The most pressing problem of the Southwest is the lack of precipitation causing heat, soil erosion, and wildfires. This also affects the water quality of lakes, rivers, canals, and dams. Yet farmers, developers, and many desert residents fail to use water wisely. 
studying the history of water in the desert and listening to it with and without hydrophones opens my students' ears and eyes. Realizing their sonic niche assignment near water, students are guided by Lockwood's interest in listening to sound, the sound of rivers, which led to her extensive river sound maps. Students collaboratively perform water-inspired pieces by Oliveros, Morrow, and from Nature Study Rides. In the next unit, the focus is on the scenic, if contested, landscapes in the Southwest. Students acquire bioregional knowledge and reflect on land ownership, conservation, and preservation. Choosing a site in nearby parks, they apply Payne's passive, directed, active, and whole body listening modes. The latter, a holistic form of listening that involves a subconscious and multisensory perception of the entire sound field. Performances of Lucier's chambers and pieces from nature study rides and Van Buren's synesthetic sounding deepen these listening modes. Next, we center on desert soils, native plants and fungi and how drought, dust storms, monsoon, non-native and invasive plants and industrial agriculture affect them. Students invest, investigate species extinction and and the sonic properties of soil, plants, and fungi. They apply Fergulin's ideas about listening to the inaudible. Discussions also address our hearing ranges, hearing loss, amplification and translation of inaudible sounds via geophones, contact mics, and hearing aids, and the imagination of sonic possibilities. Scores to be realized include Valsamara's garden and Alarcon's dreaming with flowers. The final unit focuses on native and non-native animals in urban and non-urban environments, species of a population and extinction, animal farming and speciesism. Many students are unfamiliar with desert wildlife, and Xion's mode of causal listening helps them identify animals and their calls as it centers on a sound's source. For birdsong identification, we use Cornell's Merlin Bird ID app, which provides recordings and sonograms. Xion's reduced listening mode encourages thinking about specific traits of animal songs and his concept of semantic listening situates a sound's function within a sonic ecosystem. Realizations of text pieces such as Krum White's crickets and interspecies improvisations advance this type of bioregional knowledge and environmental awareness as well. In addition to the above activities, students develop individually or collaboratively one large creative placekeeping project for a specific local community. They led workshops on communal improvisations with soundscapes, created sound walks for children, students, seniors, and people with hearing loss, and listening games for kids, including a sonic Pokemon Go. Others used field recording for sonic postcards, sound maps, soundscape compositions, and sound installations. Students who completed the desert music class have positively commented on their embodied listening and performance experiences while gaining a deeper understanding of their southwestern habitats. Equipped with critical and creative frameworks for exploring desert ecologies, they have learned to reflect about themselves as sounding and listening beings and their sonic impact on fragile desert environments. They have discovered value in sound they deemed, had deemed mostly worthless, understanding them now as a rich fabric that describes their environment. They have reported that they now listen to the desert with new ears, feeling more embedded in their environments, and they changed their lifestyle. Through community-engaged creative placekeeping endeavors, they shared their understanding of a world that desperately needs more environmental listeners and stewards to solve the problems 
of a warming planet. Thank you for listening. Hi, just a word of thanks um, because pedagogies are so important in acoustic ecology and you have such a thorough approach that, that touches pretty well everything I know or try to know. So just a word of thanks for that. And how are, how are students um, you know, uh, using this knowledge? Are they becoming sound designers and composers uh, and once they've had your training? You know, what, what, how are they applying what they learned? In yeah, so I have had um, students in music therapy and they apply, apply it uh, in their own field. I'm um, working with various clients and looking at, you know, the, the sound quality in uh, hospitals um, for youth and, um, and um, developing um, various uh, treatment um, approaches. Uh, then I have a com composition students that um, are inspired to um, create a sound installations. I have a lot of uh, music education students. They take it straight into the K-12 system, which is um, very gratifying to me. Um, and I have also uh, students in the arts in general that are working with park communities and with um, uh, seniors and I have people, uh, students in audiology that um, um, explore how you can um, rehabilitate people with hearing loss through sound walking. And so there are many applications and it, um, it has been really um, exciting for me to um, teach this class and then see how each student uh, uh, does something on their own, plus that they really um, think about how they uh, use water <laughs> more wisely and um, become better citizens of this planet. <laughs>